So just to make sure that you're here for the right session, if you don't want to hear about Azure migration paths, then um, feel free to drop off, play video games on your phone, whatever um, pleases you for this afternoon. Um, I won't go through too much of this because um, Randolph already made me blush. So uh, I'll just mention that um, I'm a Microsoft MVP. I work for Peer Storage. Um, they do not, um, they, they did not sponsor this session, but I am very proud to, to bleed orange for Pure and um, really love doing things for the Microsoft community. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to jump in throughout the session and, and just chat. It's an open session. These things are meant to be interactive and have conversations. So as much as we can have a conversation, the better. It makes it more fun for me, makes it more fun for you, and more interesting for everybody who's listening, I'm pretty sure. So um, just feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me. Um, that doesn't bother me at all. Uh, or put something in the chat. I can't see the chat. So if you're too shy to interrupt me, um, Randolph, I'm sure is not. So Randolph, if you see anything in the chat, feel free to interrupt me. Thank you, I shall. Thanks. Oh, and I'll turn up my volume because I can't hear you very well. Just so that I do hear you when you do try to interrupt me. Is my volume okay for you? It is just fine, yes. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna to try to keep this to an hour. I do have a tremendous amount of information to go over, but I really want you to understand why it's important as a data professional for you to understand the different options for Azure migrations. Um, there, are, there are lots of different options and it can be complex and confusing. Many of them are interconnected and sometimes the best solution is not just one, but a few of them that are combined. So I want you to find out and understand when and where you should use them and what, um, what information you know, need to know about each of them. So we're gonna take a look at the migrations to determine what they look like so that you each of these migrations to, to determine what they might look like so that you get familiar with each of them, so when you come across them in your day-to-day -day work lives, that you'll know which one to go to to either get a little bit more information on them, or at least be familiar to know what to do on your own, or um, what at least where to go to get more information. So Gardner, um, a reputable analyst firm, forecasts a rapid global expansion of cloud adoption, um, even more so than what we already have, with end users spending on cloud services projected to be a growth of 21.7% this year alone, along with predictions that cloud spending will exceed 45% of all enterprise IT spending by 2026. Companies that have traditionally had two options for cloud migrations easily accessible um, public clouds or customizable private cloud solutions, including today hybrid cloud environments, are expanding the possibilities. We can combine private clouds with public clouds or public clouds with adjacent data centers such as Equinix. For example, data available to customers can be stored on a public cloud server while sensitive data is kept on a secure private server. Many organizations favor a hybrid approach thanks to the flexibility of security and cost effectiveness. So according to annual state of the cloud report, 69% of businesses use a hybrid cloud solution and more than 90% of enterprises worldwide will rely on hybrid cloud by the end of 2022. So these multiple cloud deployments are in high demand with an industry survey finding that 97% of IT leaders plan to distribute workloads across two or more clouds this year. If this alone doesn't tell you that you're going to come across these, um, 
scenarios at least one time in your career in the coming three to five years, then I don't know what does. So this tells me how important it is for us to understand all of our options, not just uh, what we know today, but all the different possibilities that we might run into. So what are some of those options? There's always multiple ways to move data to Azure, and ultimately you want to find what's the easiest and the best for your organization. But what do we how do we determine that? We need to really break that down into how are we going to do that? And at the highest level, there are VM migrations and there's database migrations. So first you need to determine which of those fits your situation best. So I want to set out at the front of this presentation that although this presentation focuses on data migrations, I want you to be aware of all of your options so that you're not limiting them just due to lack of knowledge. So here are some of the data, um, the VM migrations options that are available to you. And um, I'm not sure how uh, obvious it is to you here because depending on the size of your screen, if you have this on a large monitor, it might be easier to see than on a smaller screen, but very, um, here, let me find my pointer. Way down at the very bottom here, and I will give Randolph these slides for you because I don't expect you to be able to see this, find it, or read it, um, is a link to a GitHub repository where uh, there's a huge amount of information on this on virtual machine migrations. It's very nice because it's all concise in a GitHub uh, repository that gives you step-by-step -step information about how to move VMs in, to in its um, totality. And all of the information is there. I could do an entire presentation on that alone by itself, but that that's just too extensive. So, and it's not my specialty. What I wanted to do is just give you the awareness of it if that is what would work best for your scenario, your company, if you wanted to just up and move a VM. And it's, it's not as common, it's not done as often these days, but if that's the way that you need to do it, because in certain scenarios, particularly if you have older databases uh, and you need, you need to move database, SQL Server, and everything all at once. So in the case of having, say, SQL Server 2005, something that old, and you just need to up and move it. This, these work for things where you have very small amounts of data. So I want you to just be aware of this. I've left this diagram here to give you some of the things to look out for, um, some of the storage limits, things like that, um, database version limits uh, for you to look for and be aware of, because there are in a lot of these cases, there are limitations. This is going to be a theme that's going to come up over and over and over again throughout this entire presentation. So you're going to see quite a few of these types of, or at least a couple of these types of tables, because I'm a very visual person. And I do these tables for myself because I find it's a really good way to absorb information quickly in a way that I can understand it. So if I if I'm reading through all of this information, it's not often doesn't make a lot of sense to me, or at least I don't um, retain it. But when I see it in a table like this, it just makes so much more sense and it's easy to grasp quickly and I can refer back to it quite easily. So I'm going to give you these um, slides to use at a later date and then you can refer back to them. They haven't been up. They've I've double checked them uh, just before in the last month, so they are up to date and they haven't changed all that recently. So it's not like this is something that changes very regularly by Microsoft, unlike um, Azure as they update regularly. Now let's get into the players for the on the data side. We have a number of, of different uh, players and 
Of course, with Microsoft, we get into this naming scenario where they are absolutely the worst at naming. I say this all the time, and it hasn't changed in the six years that I've been an MVP. Uh, I have no idea why, but they are terrible at naming things. Everything has to start with database or data, and it just makes things so confusing. So again, um, on the next page, I have a chart because when I first started looking at migrations, I found this very confusing because all the names sounded similar. So I found it very difficult to tell what the differences were between these tools, even though when you start using them, it becomes really obvious that they're different. But because the names are so familiar are so similar, I still find them difficult to, to tell apart sometimes. And I get them mixed up just because the names are so sim similar. And then when you start putting them into acronyms, it even gets more confusing, at least in my opinion. So we have the database experimentation assistant, the data migration assistant, the database migration service, the SQL server migration assistant, and then we have a whole bunch of other tools that we'll talk about at the end, depending on how much time we have, we'll see how much we go into them. Keep an eye on the time. So again, another table for you. And the reason for this is because there is overlap are in some of these features. You can see where the X's are, where some of the overlapping is. And you can see on the, on the second line for the analysis, in, in particular, the data migration service in the third column here, where the data migration service uses the uh, analysis of the data migration anal um, assistant to do the service to do the analysis for that service. It's a it's also used um, here. Or a similar feature is used here. Um, it's not the exact same feature, but a similar service is used there. Um, which reminds me, now that you're on the docs team, Randall, you can correct me whenever I say something wrong. This is lovely. Feel free to jump in and correct me when I'm wrong. Fortunately, one of my colleagues has been around longer, so if I get it wrong, then uh, we have another member of the team who can also correct you. I love that. Perfect. Feel free to jump in and correct me when I'm wrong. It'll be a learning experience for all of us. Um, so, um, so, so to get, sorry, that just excited me. Um, <laughs> now I have to get back on track. Sorry about that. Um, so the, the nice thing about having everything in a chart here is the ability to refer back to this later so you can tell which of these features has which, um, or which of these tools has which feature and which doesn't. I find this makes it a lot easier to decide which tool to use when and uh, for what, uh, which, which thing that you need to do. It's, it's quite simple, but um, strangely useful. I have a question, Melody. Sure. Which I know with the migration assistant, they just brought out 5.6, so they're updating that all the time. Are they doing the same with all the others? Um, I don't know how often I don't know how often they're upgrading them. I don't believe they're upgrading them as often. But the migration assistant because so much more changes within the migration assistant with the different versions um, in Azure because Azure changes all the time. I think that's why whereas the experimentation assistant for example, works mostly with on-prem versions. It, it doesn't need to be changed as often because on-prem versions don't come out as often, right? Whereas the migration assistant um, also has to look at Azure. The Azure changes much more often. Okay, great, thanks. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So 
Um, the database experimentation assist assistant. I'll go over that one. In so now I'm going to go over each of these individually so that you get an understanding of what each one is and how each one is different. And I'll give you some ideas of when to use them and why. The database experimentation assistant is a tool for evaluating upgrades of SQL Server with specific workloads. The tool can test workloads coming from SQL Server as early as 2005. And the purpose of it is to give the user confidence in a successful upgrade. This would be a first step in your analysis to determine the types of issues, if any, you would encounter in an upgrade scenario with on-premise servers. This tool can be instrumental in testing upgrades and comparing workloads. These issues and comparisons are found using a solution first introduced in SQL Server 2012 that was originally a command line only tool called Distributed Replay. It's since been expanded to have a um, a GUI or graphical user interface. And the tool collects data in a similar manner to SQL Server Profiler. You run a workload on a machine um, and collect the workload, and then you can replay that workload on other versions or configurations or setups of SQL Server. Once the analysis is run, the tool provides a report showing the performance implications based on a threshold that you choose. For example, if you deem a 7% improvement to be a notable amount, um, set the threshold to seven and the report will reflect any improvements as better than seven and any degradation as worse. And you can show that in, um, in a chart, uh, particularly a pie chart, why not a pie chart? Um, and, the, and, and the nice thing about that is you can also drill into it and get further details. Uh, I've used this uh, a few times and it's quite handy. Um, one of the great examples where I particularly liked it was when I was working at a bank, I was able to actually take um, runs from a a bank at different times of the day. So in banking, there's key times of the day that are quite busy. So when all of the um, tellers are logging on in the morning, you get a peak workload. When um, people come in at lunchtime to cash checks, there's a peak workload. And then overnight when they do all of their accounting and all of the um, stock runs and overnight processing, international things, um, bank balances get updated, that kind of thing, which is called close of business. So when that runs, those are key peak times when the bank is very, very busy in processing. Sometimes that's um, on what, what we would consider online processing. Sometimes it's more like offline processing when you don't have actual users. And all of those are very different types of workloads. And I was able to run this collection process, combine all of those together to get one workload, save that one workload um, as, an, as an entity, and use that workload to do a lot of different types of testing, and use that to test things like index changes, um, test to see when developers might uh, put in a, a code that would slow down one or, a, or not a different process. So they might put in um, some code that they think is going to, say, speed up um, teller logins, but then it has an adverse effect on some close of business processes. And they don't necessarily they aren't necessarily able to test that in their environments because they don't have uh, an easy way to run those types of workloads or um, QA testing. So this is a way to do some really great QA testing in, in your actual live environments or, or sorry, in your actual QA or uh, dev test environments. It's also a good way to test some query plans that may be running slower that you want to test and see what's causing some issues there to be able to tweak them or play around with them. Also good. So those are all, there's some really great ways to to use that to test um, migrations before you do them. So a good way to test between 
um, different versions before you do that migration or um, just your everyday testing. So there's lots of uses for this tool before you do a migration. So um, hopefully you can find that useful. It does have a reasonably complex setup uh, with multiple uh, with multiple different uh, servers and setups. But once you have it set up initially, so once you have it uh, set up initially, then it then it's done. I would recommend setting this up um, potentially uh, in can on on a on a VM that you can put aside or if if you are able to do it in containers at your workspace uh, to to be able to spin it up when you need to, that would be a, a good scenario to run that in. Uh, the other nice thing about this one is it has these clients that you can play around with. So the other possibility where another um, scenario where I've used this and it has worked very well was when um, multiple credit unions had joined and we took two credit unions and brought them together. The one credit union had just replaced all of their hardware and they had provisioned out for an expected five year growth, but they weren't sure if that five year growth additional space was going to be enough to um, uh, absorb the, the additional credit unions um, branches. So what we were able to do is with these additional replay clients um, spin up an, an additional number of clients based on the workloads of those additional branches from the other credit union and replay the, those workloads to see if we were going to put too much pressure on on the database to slow it down so much and volume wise if that um, SQL Server was going to be able to handle the additional branches and the workload. And what we determined was it was going to be so close that we were going to need additional hardware. But if we hadn't been able to actually run that test, it would have either been a guess or um, some sort of crazy mathematical calculation that I wouldn't have wanted to trust. And either way, I wouldn't have felt comfortable with the decision we made and being able to actually run this test, even though it took a couple of days, was totally worth the effort. Uh, the database migration assistant. Um, any questions before I move on? We have a question about uh, basically vendor lock-in, um, which we can we can answer at the end. Have a discussion around that, but nothing around DEA. And by the way, I learned something about distributed replay. So thank you. You're welcome. All right, database migration assistant. Um, the data migration assistant is used to find compatibility issues and other migration challenges when targeting, targeting SQL Server on a variety of platforms. The data migration assistant can recommend performance improvements and allow you to move a schema, a, a data and uncontained objects from a source to a target server. This would be a a first step in your analysis to determine the types of issues you encounter in an upgrade scenario or migration to Azure SQL database. When targeting an Azure PaaS or platform as a service database, the data migration assistant um, does the following. It finds compatibility issues, um, partially supported or unsupported features, benefits, and recommendations on how to resolve issues. This is very uh, handy for, for finding issues before they occur. Highly recommended. And that's slightly different than uh, what it does for you in a on-prem or VM scenario. There, it, when it's targeting a SQL Server on-premise or in a VM uh, or on an Azure VM, the data migration service will detect compatibility issues for upgrades, recommend potential benefits for performance, security, and storage. And one of the newer benefits is the, the SKU recommendation feature, which allows you to collect 
both performance data from your source SQL Server instance, hosting your databases, and recommend a minimum Azure SQL database or Azure SQL managed instance or SQL Server on an Azure VM SKU based on the data it's collected. Now this uh, feature provides a recommendation related to pricing tier, compute level, and data size. Uh, this is only currently available on the command line interface, but I expect that that will come to the GUI very shortly. This is um, a guess on my part, but uh, I expect it's just a matter of time because I'm sure that that's going to be a very popular feature. I know that's something that uh, customers have been asking for for a long time. It's always been a, a huge challenge for customers who have been wanting to go from on-prem to the cloud being able to determine, okay, the server they have on-prem, how do they how do they determine what that looks like um, in Azure? Because it, the, the sizing and the compute and that doesn't always look the same. It doesn't always act the same. It's hard, hard to figure out what they need without over-provisioning. So this automated feature is really a, a mindless thing that everybody's gonna wanna do. I, I, I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think it's one of the best things that Microsoft's come out with in so long. I can't believe people are not screaming about it from the rooftops myself, but that's just me. Um, I get excited about the silliest things. Um, so before I go on to the next thing, any questions about that? Or does everybody want to just jump onto the roof and scream with me because it is very exciting? Melody, it's very exciting. and. If I'm not mistaken, there was an announcement made recently about an Azure Data Studio ex uh, extension that uh, might be doing that. So, worth looking at. Azure Data Studio extension. I'm just looking for that. I I, I seem to remember tweeting oh, about that it. Oh, that might be that might be even part of my demo. Oh, awesome. It's yeah. it's oh. um. Yeah, go ahead. It's a, it's at the bottom where you can put in the command at the bottom, but it's not quite completely integrated into Azure Data Studio. I'll, I'll show you later in the bottom what I mean, or I'll show you in the demo what I mean, but it's not quite integrated yet. But I think it's, uh, it's close. Is option that I actually respond to? Sorry, say that again? There is a feedback option when you run it. Um, I've seen situations where it doesn't come out correctly and they do actually get back to you. Oh, in Azure Data Studio? No, the DMA. That's cool. Oh, okay. That's cool. Thank yeah, you. I do find da um, data migration um, very good, actually. Um, and then the data migration service itself. So before we even start about what it does, I want to start with a warning about not running this on the same machine as the machine that you're migrating from, because um, it, it can use a lot of resources and you don't want them to be competing for resources. So I just want to uh, remind you of that if you're actually going to be running it. Um, it currently does not run, it does not migrate agent jobs, so keep that in mind as well, and there is a workaround to that. Um, Azure Database Migration Service is a managed service, and, and it's known for its ability to do online, online migrations. It's designed specifically for the migration of multiple databases, which is quite nice when you have interconnected databases that need to be migrated together because of interconnected um, dependencies. And that that's a big issue for a lot of uh, a lot of companies because their interconnected um, data is not necessarily um, with keys. It's just um, it's just interrelated, but not 
in any formal way, I guess is a way to explain it. I see that a lot when I'm in consulting where it's not formally related, but it's important and it is related, but there's no, in, it's, uh, there's a word for that, but it's not, <laughs> it's, it's just is related, but you wouldn't know it otherwise. And it's really easy to mess it up. Um, the service is a combination of data migration assistant um, that generates the assessment and the migration service itself, which performs the actual steps needed to do the migration, which we had talked about before when we looked at um, the actual table. Um, it's a service with a pricing tier. However, even the premium tier allows for both online and offline migrations to be free up to 183 days after the creation of the service. So the reason for that is Microsoft doesn't want you to be creating a online migration to be using it for a way to just constantly be migrating data, to be using it as a flow through process. But the idea is to set it up and actually move your data and be done with it. It's not meant to be a portal. So, and really there is no reason that after 183 days that you shouldn't be able to do it, but after 183 days, it would cost you money. Uh, I think 183 days is a reasonable amount of time for you to get your project up going and be completed. Using Azure Data Migration Service to perform an online migration requires creating an instance based on the premium Pricing tier, um, data migration service performs both online, which is a continuous sync and an offline migration. It's recommended that if you are doing a homogeneous migration, you access your existing databases using the migration assistant. For heterogeneous migration from complete sources, access your databases with SSMA. With an offline migration, the downtime begins at the mi at the time the migration begins. To limit your downtime, it's recommended that you use an online migration option to keep things in sync for the time between the completion and the cutover. So the online option allows you for little a little less downtime and for it to be limited only to the cutover period during that migration. So you can keep it online and processing and then the, just down for the time of the actual cutover. And is there any questions about the migration service? None at the moment. Perfect. So let's take a look at how that migration works. So in, I'll switch to my laser pointer here so that you can see this. Um, I won't go through this in too much detail just for the sake of time. It, um, I'll leave you with this diagram because sometimes it's, I went through a lot of steps and explanations, and uh, it's sometimes easier, again, back to the diagrams. I like diagrams, and it's sometimes easier to just follow a diagram to know that when, when you're migrating data that you've got step one, step two, these are all the different steps. Um, it goes, and to understand that there's a self-hosted integration runtime that it uses to create that, um, online process, so uh, to keep the data in sync during the time that you're online until the actual cutover. So what I'm going to do is um, prepare for the demo, and because the demo can take quite a while, I, I prepared ahead of time. I did make sure that I had a, a source database already set up so that you didn't have to wait for that. And I made sure I had a target database set up. So I have a SQL server on an Azure VM, which is pre-set up. 
And I did that and I just wanted to give you this so you had an idea of what that looked like to make sure that you see how it's all, that everything is set up, everything's created correctly. So that when you go to do it on your own, that you know what that looks like, what, what you should see, how everything is um, set up, you know that you're gonna have, say, your VNets, your IPs and all everything um, set up correctly. And then it all comes back complete. And then we'll get into the demo. So to also ensure for the demo, I made sure that the, um, for the backup, I had the other thing I had to have was a backup, a recent backup. So for this backup, I did, I made sure that um, the backup is one taken outside of the tool and is done with a checksum. And I made sure I did a DBCC check DB on it before migrating, which would be best practices, just to make sure that I'm not migrating something that is um, corrupted. And I did compress it uh, because it's a very large database. And one of the nice things to know about this tool is if you're using TDE, when you migrate the certificate manually, um, or, you, or sorry, if you're if you're using TDE, you have to migrate the certificate manually. Uh, but if you're using always on encryption, DMS will take care of that for you. So you don't have to worry about doing anything. But if you're using TDE, you have to migrate the certificate manually. So that's just something to remember when using encryption. So I'm going to I'm going to turn off my slides and you can think about some really good questions for me while I switch over to my demo. Well, we can we can go back to the question that was raised earlier. So Carrie asks one question in three parts, but basically it comes down to vendor lock-in. If you are migrating to the cloud, how easy is it to get out of the cloud? What's the kind of life expectancy of your data while it's in the cloud? And which tools out of the ones you've shown us so far would probably be the most useful for getting your data back out of the cloud again if you need to? <laughs> good questions, right? Yes, good questions. And um, keep in mind, there's a whole bunch of Microsoft employees on this call. So maybe we should chat after. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, most of these are Microsoft tools, they're all about getting your data into the cloud. Um, the there are there is actually a tool at the end in the um, in the other tools that is a tool that will help you get data in and out of the cloud. Um, yes. Do you have a better and, answer to that, Randolph? I would I would say that um, any vendor is going to make it a little bit more difficult to get your data out of the cloud than into it. Yes. But Microsoft will definitely tell you that there are ways to get your data out of the cloud if you if you need to. Um, yes. I, and I can't and, speak for the vendors. Yeah. Yeah, Microsoft will make it just like AWS or any other vendor will will make it more difficult to get it out there um, at the end of the uh, towards the end. I have other options as well for getting in and out. That's one of the other options is how to get it in and out. So we can talk. We'll get to that a little bit later. Remind me if I forget. Yeah. Um, so this is my Azure Data Studio. I have a local um, a local database on my local server here where I have uh, tables, regular tables in a database in this server. And I want to move that to this, um, my Azure migration server, where I just have system databases and I have no other databases. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to move from the local server here, which is AdventureWorks 2019, and we're going to move it to my migration server, sir. And so there is a add-in 
um, called Azure SQL Migration, which uh, on-prem you can use it as a separate um, app, or now there's an integration that is fairly new for Azure Data Studio. And this is the add-in for Azure Data Studio that was recently in private preview and has recently just gone GA. Melody, you were saying before to ensure you have a backup of your data. And um, why not just do a backup here inside of ADS instead of a third-party vendor? You said um, you had to check some? Do yeah, I did, do, I did do a native SQL Server backup. Um, I did a native SQL Server backup. And then I had, then I moved it. Um, then I had to move it to a location that um, that it could find it. And because I don't, uh, because I'm not a corporation, I didn't have a network drive to put it on. I just had my laptop um, to do demos on. I had to actually put it in the cloud, which is kind of silly, but to make the demo work. <laughs> But normally that's what you would do. You would just take a, a, a regular um, native backup and you could use that backup. So it's just a regular backup. So for, for your reference, Carrie, a checksum is just an additional operation that happens in the SQL Server native backup command. You can just add a, a separate switch that'll do a checksum as well. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, sorry, yes. So if you if you if you want to assess your database from inside, so you can assess your VM and you can assess your database as well for issues and your VM for the size. There. Oh, I see what you're saying. I thought I did that already. You did, but then you accidentally closed the window. So I think it just. Ah, uh, I see. And keep in mind that this always defaults alphabetically. So you have to choose Canada. That's a very good tip. Otherwise, everything's going to be in Australia. Yep. Which is very slow. How many times has it happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, um, I don't actually have any resource groups in Australia, so it just doesn't work for me. It just says can't find resource group because it goes to location first. That's smart. So none of my resource groups are in Australia. So it just doesn't work for me, but then it takes me a while to figure out why. <laughs> but when you put your resource group in, it then it finds the right virtual machine, which is kind of funny, so. That's handy though. Um, I'm going to do the offline migration just because it's far simpler and a little bit faster. And I'm just, I'm not doing it repetitively. We're just doing this one time as a demo. And because, like I said, I'm not, I don't have a network share set up. I just did it in a blob store. Um, I'd also like to carry the attention to the warning that says ensure your backups were taken with the with checksum option. That's what Melody was referring to earlier as well. Uh, resource group. Yeah, and, that, and then the other important thing is if it's not the most recent backup, it doesn't work. So it has to be the absolute most recent backup. If you take another backup afterwards, you have to use that one. Otherwise it won't work.
fill in the rest of my information to make sure my service is all set up, orchestrate it. Just double check that everything is set up correctly and off it goes. I'll get this message here. I'll refresh this because it changes. Now it says zero, one in progress, and we'll let that go for a bit. I'll come back here, stop, and I'll go back to my slide deck for a moment. Show you some more pre-slides. Try to. See the demo one? Yes. OK. So that's a video in case we couldn't get that to work. So we'll move on. So the SQL Server Migration Assistant is um, essentially the same thing from SQL Server to SQL Server, but if you want to go from SQL Server to DB2, MySQL, Oracle, Sybase, or Access. Uh, I'm not, I will admit, not as familiar with this because I don't very often have to do it. Um, I know people who have done it. I understand it works just as well. There's lots of people who are uh, very good at it. And I know a couple of people who have done it. I actually don't know a lot of people who have done it, but if you need to do it, uh, I'm sure I can find somebody in the community who's done it or who can give you some advice. So if you, if you find the need to do one of these conversions and run into some troubles, let me know. In the deck, there are, um, at the very end of the deck, I have a lot of resources listed for you. And there are, um, of course, my favorite, a link to every doc for each one of these, because um, the docs are actually quite good. Because of course, Randolph is working on them. Why wouldn't they be awesome? Um, so the Microsoft docs is where I would recommend you go for, for information on that. And then if you get stuck on that, then reach out to me or Randolph and we can find somebody in the community who can help you, would be my recommendation. Then causes of failures, things to look out for, things that might cause you issues, things just to be aware of. Um, and of course, cats, right? Like who doesn't need a good cat picture in every, in every webinar, right? So hierarchical data types, they're, um, I don't wanna really say not supported, but are sort of supported, but they have to be version 2019 to be migrated properly. Otherwise, just exclude any tables with these data types from the configuration migration settings when you specify tables for migration. Alternately, if, if it's an option, migrate these data types offline. You can use this code to determine if any of the tables you have columns, in any of the tables you have columns that have an unsupported data type. For temporal tables, that are not supported for online migration, exclude these tables from the configuration migration um, table blades, or you specify tables for migrations. Um, triggers, just don't even go there. But if you have to, um, they're not supported for online migrations. Um, large object data types will require special handling. In this context, large value data types are those that exceed a minimum row size of eight kilobytes. Um, column large, columns larger than 32 kilobytes and they might get truncated at the target. So I would recommend you exclude those from the, um, exclude those entirely. Or, to, oh, and timestamps, if, if you need the original timestamps, because those will get updated when you move the data, if your timestamps need to be updated or need to stay the same, so this is really common in banking data, 
they need to they absolutely need to stay the same um i would in banking data that just goes without saying so if you were to be say migrating banking data um my understanding is that you can contact the engineering team and find somebody to help you with that and there are workarounds but it has to be done in conjunction with microsoft and there is a workaround that they can do to help you migrate those tables that have timestamps that need to stay the same and can't be changed. So those are the recommendations for those. Luckily, there's not too many of them. Um, I really appreciate that. I think Microsoft's done a really great job on that tool. So this is where we get to other options because you know there's always other paths and other ways of doing things. Um, I had mentioned earlier uh, agent jobs. Oops. Not too fast. Not too fast. Um, the DMA has a new code checker, which is super cool. Um, various third party companies, and then always customization. But one thing I want to note before I move on is backpacks are no longer supported by Microsoft for migrations to Azure. And that's that's a pretty important one. So I don't I don't want anybody to forget that because I know quite a few people were doing that. I don't want uh, I don't want anybody to forget that. Anybody here ever um, doing that? Yeah, and that, that's how it used to be done. It yeah. was that was the only way you created your schema and your data in a in a backpack and a backpack file, and then that's how it got into the cloud. No longer supported. Awesome. <laughs> was that a sarcastic yeah. awesome? <laughs> um, it's one less thing to document. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there is a question from Carrie, which is tangentially related to what you're about to talk about, but the question is. When migrating to the cloud, is it generally to store a static backup of your data, or is it best to use the cloud dynamically? And um, I'll let you answer, Melody. But but from my point of view, it, it depends on what what your what your end goal is. If you're trying to migrate your environment to the cloud to save costs and maintenance things and all that kind of stuff, then it's dynamic. But if you just need a backup location, do it that way. Well, I was That's just thinking because uh, you're failures might involve the triggers it's like isn't that something that is kind of necessary like if you've got built-in triggers you want them to go with your data and if that's what's going to make your migration fail then that can't be good so the triggers are that you if you're doing an online migration that means you don't um you don't want the um, how do i how do i describe this you don't want they're concerned that if something has to be replayed that triggers might happen more than once i guess is what they're concerned about. Um, triggers can get messy when there's mistakes because of the way data can get propagated. And they would prefer not, I, I think they're just hedging their bets on issues with data. So this is to move data to the cloud, not to be a form of disaster recovery. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the idea is like a one time move, not to be an ongoing process. So this this is not a way to move data. And this is not a replacement for log shipping, for example. So you're not constantly moving data to the cloud to be your disaster recovery site. But if you take a backup and you just pick it up and you move it, then that's fine. That's completely different than, um, then, then you have your triggers, your triggers would still exist in the, in the copy that would end up in the cloud, 
So if you had to move a, a copy to the cloud and then you used it there in a disaster scenario, your, your triggers as code would still exist if you needed to revert back to that database. So the triggers would, you could have them exist in that new database. They just, they don't want them to activate as the data is moving, if that makes sense. Yes, somewhat. I, I haven't experienced anything like that, but um, I could see where that would work. It would be better to do an offline migration if you have triggers, is essentially what they're saying. So just move the data as I'm doing in my example here with a offline migration. So the database is offline, just move the data. Which is set, ultimately you could just take a backup and just move the backup. It's the same thing. Yeah. You might as well just move the backup to to the cloud, and then then you've got your DR backup in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Would you not agree, Randall? Oh, I agree. I I, I thoroughly agree. So. Um, let's look at these just quickly. The nice thing about DBA tools is it's open source, but it only does offline. It, it is done in PowerShell, so if PowerShell is not your uh, a tool that you're comfortable in, it might be a little bit more challenging. It, however, it does include my, it does include the ability to do migrations for logins and agent jobs. So um, in the resources at the end, I did include an example um, or a link to a blog that was written by a Microsoft employee, um, a tech community Microsoft blog. And the it was a data migration services that was done, hmm, want to say two years ago now, where um, an offline migration was done with DBA tools, including the agent job, and there's um, some code included, and that includes the agent jobs. So even if you wanted to do everything the way that we just did it, but you had agent jobs you wanted to migrate, you, you can use that as a starting off point to understand the process of how to use that DBA tools code or that PowerShell scripting with the agent jobs to be able to just move your agent jobs with that code. So at least it's a jumping off point, a, a place to start and that will help you get started. Another quick question, when you're when you're planning your migration, let's say you've got data that's the size of AdventureWorks, what, how long is your planning stage? Or is it just, hey, let's move this data to the cloud. Uh, boom, you're done in an afternoon. I would say it depends on how old your data is. Um, I've had clients, and I'll kind of get into that next here, where the code is the issue. So this is a, a really great new tool that just came out um, in the latest version of DMA5, and it introduces support for analyzing um, database connectivity um, and embedded queries. And this runs in the um, Data Access Migration Toolkit, uh, which is a Visual Studio code extension in the latest version only, I believe. Um, and what it does is it produces a, um, a piece of JSON that can be run and it analyzes queries that'll be run through DMA that um, for compatibility and feature parity issues on the target SQL platform. So it basically runs and checks your, uh, your code and spits out a JSON format that can be checked by the, by the DMA to determine if that code that, or the 
the code that's in your application is going to be compatible and where the parity is and missing pieces are to to see if that's going to be compatible with the database that you're going to be running against. Because when I, while I was consulting, what I found is it was a lot of the legacy code, not the database itself that was causing issues. So people would upgrade their database and they'd get all new hardware, brand new database, and everything would still be running slow as molasses. And then they'd call the soft, the hardware vendor and say, why is th why are things still slow? And they'd be blaming the hardware vendor saying, you know, my SQL server is still slow. You know, it's the fastest this, the fastest that, why is it still slow? How, why, why is that? And then, you know, it's up to the vendor to prove that it's the code. So it's, it's things like this that you have to check. So when it comes to a migration, you have to check your data in the database to make sure it's ready to be moved. You have to check the code to make sure it's compatible and ready to move. And then you have to check your applications to make sure they're compatible to move, whether that's compatibility mode or whether the vendor who sells that application is ready to support you at that compatibility. Those are the three really the big things. Does that make sense? Yep. Sorry, that was a lot of information all at once. And then there's always um, there's always the the third party vendor solution, which of course I'm going to mention Pure because that's who I work for and I love. But there are others out there that um, do these same things. You know, they they have built in deduplication and compression, which you know limits the amount of data that you have to move, so saves space in the cloud, which reduces your cost. And the amount of data you have to move, making things like compression and th thin provisioning easier and reduces the amount of capacity, making it easier, allows you to mirror across availability zones for business continuity. And one of the things that you were asking about, they also allow you to move data seamlessly, easy and bi-directionally back on prem without any difficulty. That was answer that question, doesn't it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then a whole slew of um, resources for you. I, I I would like to give a special shout out again to DBA Tools. Uh, Chrissy Lemaire is one of the founding, well, the founder of of the of the project, and uh, still maintains it with a group of uh, very like-minded people. It is one of the best productivity tools for database administrators anywhere. So if you are a DBA or if that is part of your role, I would strongly encourage you to get into DBA tools. It's also an excellent way to learn PowerShell. And out of the 500 or so commandlets that are on DBA tools, Many, 75% or more of them will also work on Linux and Mac OS because it's PowerShell. And um, so it, it shouldn't matter to a large degree what your favorite uh, platform for development is. You can still use DBA tools on almost everywhere. So definitely look into that. And as you all know now, I am a Microsoft employee and I still would recommend you using DBA tools. It's really, really good stuff. So I'm going to stop presenting. I am going to go back to my my uh, 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 where is it here? Randolph, take this moment to uh, tell us about your book. Oh, uh, too late. Too late. It's back to Melody. <laughs> Sorry, it's complete. It, this won't take long. So you can see that the migration is complete. I go over here, I refresh, check for databases and find my AdventureWorks database. Actually has tables, yay. 
And I can get data. That was relatively quick, considering it was 300 gig, uh, 300 megs. So, yeah, 300 gigs. I wish that was that was quite impressive. Yeah, so that wasn't too bad. If your data, if your databases are only in SQL Server, would you say that you should not run into data migration troubles? What version? Actually, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry? What, what version? version? Oh, Sorry, uh, gonna... we'll go with the one I'm using, 2019. Likely not too much, depending on what code you're using. Like the database itself, you probably won't have much trouble. And so when you say the code. The application, uh, what do you have custom applications? Um, oh, that's interesting. OK, I didn't think about that. I know nothing of this, and so I'm just still learning quite a bit. Um, but no, not at this time. Oh, but that's uh, that's what I need to think about. OK, I'm just thinking if I ever had to do a migration, fancy one that these are questions I would have to ask myself prior to doing the migration. That's yes. why I asked about what the process was. You know, how long, how long do you plan for the migration? The sort of thing. Randolph, what, what's your dog's name again? It's Tilly. Tilly. <laughs> well, run, then, the, run the data migration assistant and see what that says okay. and that'll tell you a lot to start with and then and then you can run the depending on if you have any custom code then you can run the code checker and that will tell you a lot and then well, you'll have a sense of where you're at well because azure devops has uh, pipelines and I, i'm not 100 percent sure what those are but can you not migrate within Azure Data uh, DevOps? I I wouldn't. No. So, Carrie, would. what, what? Yeah, what you're talking about is a is a fairly major um, infrastructure change. So you would treat this like you would treat any sort of upgrade or migration on premises. You would spend a lot of time planning. Uh, you would do a lot of research to see what would be affected, who would be affected. Uh, this is not a this is not a one afternoon job at all. If you're talking about production data, if you want to yeah. play around and you'll see, well, it'll only take me a, a half a day to do it. Like Melody's example of AdventureWorks, that's great. But there's a lot of other stuff that you you may not know about until you go and speak to the stakeholders. So, yeah, I would treat it as any any type of migration. Just because it's going to the cloud doesn't change the complexities involved. I would say. Okay. And. And and to Melody's point previously, um, if you are migrating from SQL Server, uh, anything from 2008 and upwards should be okay. Uh, where you might find problems is in your stored procedures, your views, your your uh, application code, and if you've got stuff like linked servers, because a lot of people forget about stuff like that. So you've you've got to do you've got to do your your due uh, due process, I think it's called. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's. Yeah, that's why Melody is a consultant to help you do these kind of things. I'm not trying to shill for Melody here, but um, there's stuff that you may not be able to do yourself. So there's there's no shame in asking for a consultant to come and help you. And yeah, this is the kind of stuff that shouldn't be done in an afternoon. OK, I'll, I'll just say it that way. Uh, Josh has a question. If I have a database with stored procedures with deprecated and unsupported SQL, that's what I was just talking about, can it still be migrated into Azure or are we limited to an Azure VM SQL? That's a good question, Josh. Do you want to take that, Melody? If it's got deprecated features. Deprecated um, features. Can it still be migrated into Azure, like MI, or are you restricted to using a SQL VM? It, it so depends like, on what the features are. So yeah. you could probably migrate everything except for the features, those specific specific features. Well, for, for example, the example that Josh just used here was star joins. Well, star joins are 
<laughs> I'll tell you, star joins, if you've got your compatibility level low enough, will still work. But I wouldn't. I really wouldn't do that. I would fix oh, your code okay. first. Would you want to? Why? Why would you want to? <laughs> I mean, that's a typically, great question. <laughs> typically, things are deprecated for a reason. Yeah, typically things are deprecated for a reason, and those things should probably be fixed before they're moved. Yeah, you see the the use case here, and I've seen this before with the upgrade advisor. Is the code is never called? The vendor just hasn't removed it, and it's still going to show up during all those assessments but then you have to weigh the risks or you can move to an Azure VM and that's fine, but it's probably going to cost you a little bit more than if you were, because you've still got your maintenance that you have to handle, uh, than just moving it to a yeah. DB MI. But it's, it's, yeah, what are the pros and cons? Josh, I'm going to say it depends. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I finally got quiet enough too that I didn't feel like I had to type on this end. <laughs> well, because I was going to say it is—it is running in 2017. I just didn't know if there was anything in the migration assistant that would say like, "Oh no, we just—we're not going to let you move that there at all because you've got to clean up your code first. There, there. Well, there's no, there's almost no situation where Microsoft will say no to you. Worst case scenario, you go, we take you to the product team and they'll help you do it. If you want to go to Azure, I can find you a way to do it. Yeah. And the foot there, there's a way at Microsoft that's going to tell you, no, you can't go to Azure. I guarantee it. I, I think that explains some other things that we've also heard from our vendor, but now I'm just trash talking. So <laughs> luckily, we're not recording this. Oh, good. So how do we get our data out, migrated out of Azure? So our company is belly up. We have no money for for data storage or you know interaction sort of thing. How do we how do we migrate out? If your company's belly up, how do you afford to get it out? Eh. We have like a Hail Mary from, from the bankruptcy court. <laughs> um, it depends on what your what storage vendor you have, what data services vendors you have at the moment. And um, you should probably plan for that before you go belly up and before you go in. If there's any chance that you think that you might ever have to take your data out or have plans to move it, you make those decisions before you go in. That's all part of your planning. It's like walking into a dark alley. You don't go in unless you know where the exits are. Interesting. Or, or it's a problem whoever purchases the remaining assets. <laughs> Bought all this data. Can we, get, can we get it? It hasn't happened, but you know, you never know. Um, I I have my own personal kind of cloud stuff, and uh, every time a SQL database goes beyond five bucks, I kick it out and delete it. <laughs> Ready. Any other questions for Melody? I, I had some people when the questions started, so. Don't take it personally, but we had um, 13 people in the room at, at peak, so that's a good turnout considering how badly I messed up the invites. Um, so thank you, Melody. Josh, did you have another question? I, was gonna, I had a, me a mechanical question that I wanted to ask just about the migration. Uh, I want to make sure I kind of understand what it's doing. Melody, you said that you have to use the most recent full backup to do that migration. Is it? Is the is the migration process at some point like taking a log backup that it needs that um, backup chain to be correct for that to work, which is why you can't have like another fold to break that, where it's doing like a uh, a log backup or a tail 
of the log to get the, anything that might have changed since the full backup was was taken? Well, when you're when it does the in that particular for that particular scenario of that migration, the intention is that you're bringing it back online because it's it thinks that you're mi migrating it to bring it online. Mm -hmm. So yes, it expects you to be bringing it online. So it's expecting you to bring it back up. So it has to be that most recent one so that you can bring it online. Okay, but there's not necessarily a mechanical backup reason for that. They're just, they're just kind of forcing a, a best practice into the process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what's the terminology for when, because it's not, you migrate up to the cloud, but what do you do when you come out of the cloud? Is it migrate out or is it export out or? Uh, there is a word for it. And what tool are we going to use? I think it's egress, isn't it? You're um, muted, Randolph. Is egress I'm the right egress. word? Egress is is one word. I would also use the word export because it's not an online operation in most cases, unless you're using a particular high availability data synchronization feature that we haven't spoken about today. It's the idea here, Carrie, is that it's probably a one way one way street for for this thing, and if you're looking to use the cloud as a temporary location or just as a high availability thing, then you wouldn't be thinking of it in terms of migration. You'd be thinking of it in a different way, like high availability and something like that. Mm -hmm. Does that help you? Recovery. Yeah. yeah. Well, I haven't had any situations, but you know, I I always ask all the questions prior. So yeah, that's part of the research process. Exactly. So. Um, are there any other questions? Thank you, Melody, very much for your time for presenting to us this evening. Thank you to all of our attendees. And I am very grateful that we had so many. And I'm grateful for the information you shared today, Melody. I'm also grateful for the questions, Carrie, don't get me wrong. And Josh as well, who had to drop off. I appreciate everyone still taking an interest in the user group given the circumstances going on in the world. It's one of the highlights of my month, so thank you very much, everyone.